supports the central theme of Colossians on growing in maturity and fullness through Christ. Now, today's passage coincides with what we've already heard in parts of chapter one and chapter two of Colossians. I'm going to read those now. In chapter one of Colossians, we read these verses as part of our assurance. Verses 21 and 22. Once you were alienated from, from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. We move now into chapter two, and I'm going to read verses nine through verse 15. This is from last week's passage, and it immediately precedes this week's passage. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In him, you were also circumcised with the circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins, in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, trying umphan over them by the cross. Now we move into the, our passage for the day, for today, which articulates even more how the followers of Christ are to be as heirs in God's, fam, God's royal family. We read from verse 16 of chapter 2 through the end of the chapter. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great delight about what they have seen. They are puffed up with they are puffed up with the idle notions by their unspiritual mind. They have lost connection with the head from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its roles? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These roles, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual desires. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. So this passage directs the followers of Christ, that's us, not to judge by what fellow believers eat or drink, nor by religious festival. Paul writes this because those raised in the Jewish faith are taught that righteousness is gained through the practice of Jewish customs 
and traditions, such as circumcision and keeping kosher, not eating certain foods, particularly for Sabbath and other religious festivals. We heard of Mike Bernstein, um, a member of our church who is a me Messianic Jew, preach on this from Ephesians about the one new man. And author Blumenthal, who Mike referred in his preaching, says that these beliefs of customs and traditions giving righteousness is considered Jewish dogma. Now, there is a difference between the Messianic and the traditional Jew, however. While customs may still be practiced as a part of Jewish tradition by Messianic Jews, they are no longer considered the means to righteousness. Followers of Yeshua, the name that is used for Jesus by the Jews, followers of Yeshua know that through scripture, Righteousness does not come through human offerings, but through the final offering of Jesus Christ made in full on the cross. However, early believers of Yeshua believed that it was required for all believers to ascribe to Jewish traditions like kosher eating, religious festivals, and circumcision, even the Gentiles. Even Peter, the esteemed apostle of Christ, believed these traditions at first necessary. But clarity comes to Peter. If we open the book of Acts, we're not going to do that today, but I would invite you to read it. Acts chapter 10, verses 9 through 16. It tells us how Peter receives a vision of a sheep coming down from heaven and it's full of animals, but they're all unclean. And Peter is invited to eat. And he says, at first, no, I won't take and eat. But God says, don't call unclean what I have created good and have made clean. Now, after the vision, Peter is invited to be the guest at the house of a Gentile believer, Cornelius, a Roman centurion which is even more extreme. And being at the table with Gentiles was forbidden by Jewish custom. They were to stay separated from non-Jews. However, Peter went. He went to Cornelius's house and he ate there. And this all occurred because of this vision, similar to the words that Paul gives us today of having freedom in the reality of Christ. So Peter chooses not to lose his freedom in the reality of Christ. Peter didn't live under accusation and condemnation that comes through tradition and custom with rules like, listen to the rules, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, which Paul writes are merely human commands and teachings. Now, besides the Jewish faith, there are even certain Christian traditions such as Eastern Orthodox, Byzantine, and Roman Catholic that also teach the necessity of not eating certain foods, especially during the season of Lent that precedes and prepares for Easter. In the Roman Catholic tradition in which I was raised, at that time, we weren't even permitted to eat meat on any Friday at all. No Friday was there any meat eating. Now it's just Good Friday. I was also required to confess to a priest when I broke food rules or didn't attend church on required religious festival. But I had gotten my first Bible. You've heard me tell this story, age eight. I read it diligently and I looked through it asking, where in the Bible does it say that we're not allowed to eat hot dogs on Friday? My poor mom, I had to ask this question of her. Like eating kosher, fasting from meat on Fridays was a human custom or tradition. But Paul, in reminding us of freedom and the reality of Christ, says that we are free from accusation with these things. Do not judge anyone by what they eat or drink. Do not submit to human rules, Paul says, of do not handle, do not taste, 
or do not touch. A requirement to adhere to these rules is one that takes away our freedom in the, real, uh, in the reality of Jesus Christ, where we're free from accusation. So in this, we should be reminded of a time where God gave his first command in the Garden of Eden. And these rules of do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, should remind us of God's word then. It happened that God had gave a command and a direction, but the serpent came in chapter three, verse one, and asked this question, raising doubts. Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman who was there in verse two answers the question, and she answers it at first well. She says, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden so do not taste however the words at first accurately reflect what god says but then she adds by her own humanness to god's word she says this and you must not touch it do not handle do not touch god didn't say that at all the woman added human words to God's word. This addition of adding to God's word is a final warning, the final warning that comes to us in the Bible in the book of Revelation. In chapter 22, 19, it says this, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this scroll, if anyone adds, if anyone adds anything to them, to the words, God will add to the person the plagues described in this scroll. So what a warning. Paul warns and other parts of the Bible ward, warn, do not add to God's words. Now, as Reformed Pres Protestant Presbyterians, we may think that we're off the hook because we don't traditionally practice fasting. We may think today's passage doesn't apply to us, but all of scripture applies to everyone. Today, we're gonna to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Here is a description of the Lord's Supper from what we have as our directory of worship regarding the communion element of bread. It says the bread used for the Lord's Supper should be common to the culture of the congregation. Should be, but is not required to be ordinary bread, that is bread that is usually served on our table at home. So that means depending on what part of the world you're in, the bread may look different. In France, it may be baguettes. In Ireland, soda bread. In Mexico, tortillas. In Greece, pita, or many other kind of breads from other areas around the world. So what is ordinary, depends on where we are. Now today, we're gonna to have our bread as we're supposed to have, but it's not going to be what we consider ordinary bread, at least mine isn't. So I'm gonna show you what I have. It is a little communion cup that is covered, and on top of it is the host, such as is used in Eastern Orthodox, um, Byzantine and Catholic churches. It's covered by a piece of cellophane that I can remove to have access to the bread and a piece of foil to have access to the juice. Why, are, why am I using this very non-ordinary bread and method of communion today? Well, for one thing, it's COVID. You're safe at home. I could have used ordinary bread and juice here, but at the church, we use this. And it's not just because of COVID that we're using this. When we do something that is non-traditional, sometimes we make non-traditional church choices so that we can align in compassion and unity with those who have special health needs. And that is the case with this bread and with this cup. I have taken these many times to serve communion to homebound members. And sometimes as people get older, 
serving ordinary bread with crumbs becomes a choking hazard. So this bread, on the other hand, is it melts in your mouth and it's not a choking hazard. So besides this being safe for COVID, it's also safe for those who have special needs. Now, the one thing it's still not safe, this bread has gluten. Another reason why we might want to do non-ordinary bread is to serve gluten-free bread. There are those who have a disease called celiacs. My oldest daughter suffers from this. My best friend suffers from this. It is not a fad. It is not a lifestyle. It, is, it threatens the health of a person to eat gluten. So there are many churches who have decided they're no longer serving bread with gluten and they serve gluten-free alternatives. Again, to stand in unity for the health needs and safety of our fellow brothers and sisters. There is also, oh, and I talked about this at the first church where I was at, I, and we had many people who worked in the medical field, but they said, absolutely not. Are we going to go to gluten-free bread? It tastes yucky. It's not communion. And yes, we use, use uh, Scottish shortbread which is far from ordinary bread. So there was a refusal out of compassion to do something for the sake of those who have health needs. And we had a number of people in the congregation who had celiacs and had need not to eat gluten. There's also something else in the way of the juice. For decades and decades, the juice was always fermented because it kept things sanitary. Um, it's naturally disinfecting. So the fermented juice with alcohol does that. But in our time, there was a prohibition, um, at least for some of the older adults in our congregation may remember the time when alcohol was prohibited to be taken. And at that time, Welch's uh, came up with uh, Welch's grape juice. And so now we more commonly use unfermented grape juice, Welsh's or another product. And even though alcohol is allowed and it's permissible um, for those who struggle with alcoholism, with an addiction, it is a compassionate choice for them as well. So the point is, though everything is permissible, all different kinds of bread, all different kinds of juice, scripture tells us not everything is necessarily beneficial. And so the scripture passage today, it may be appealing to us to make compassionate, non-traditional choices for those who have health needs. That way we can live under the freedom of the reality of Christ for the sake of the health of others. Jesus ascribed to this when on Sabbath, he was told the tradition and custom said, you can't heal on the Sabbath. And Jesus broke those rules to provide for people's health in, this, uh, in the synagogues so that they might be safe and well and healed. So Jesus ascribed to this passage today, even though it was written after him. Now, there are other examples, too, of the re re relevance of today's passage for traditional churches that voluntarily take on the necessity of traditions adding to God's word not required in scripture that may keep us from experiencing fully the freedom of the reality of Christ. Now, this doesn't mean, please don't take this as I'm saying, we should drop every tradition. But the point is, if we open ourselves up to things beyond our tradition that are not required in scripture, we can further discover freedom and maturity in Christ and be blessed. For example, wasn't it a blessing this morning to hear Tom Kimball play Bach on the ukulele? The ukulele is far from being a traditional instrument that we hear in the Presbyterian church. Besides the organ and piano, we may hear bagpipes from time to time because it's part of the Scottish heritage. But ukulele, probably first time we've ever heard that. But it was a beautiful addition to our worship today, and it enhanced it. And the ukulele is traditional in some places like Portugal and later carried as the traditional instrument into Hawaii. It's a small guitar. Similarly, on Christmas Eve, we sing Silent Night, usually 
from the organ um, with the organ accompaniment or a piano, but usually the organ. But did you know that in Germany, Silent Night was written by an organist to be played and accompanied on the guitar. So we should open ourselves up to be blessed by a strong uh, menagerie of instruments that just enhance worship and allow us to experience praise more beautifully. We also might be introduced to other traditions like on Good Friday, we had the Stations of the Cross, which is um, a Roman Catholic tradition where we were able to meditate upon Jesus's journey to his death. Last week, we meditated on the transcendence of God through Isaiah, where we learned, um, where we heard scripture from Isaiah. But next week, I will bring in a picture of uh, Eastern Orthodox and Byzantine icon, a tradition for us to use to reflect upon Jesus Christ. Point is, we have freedom in the reality of Christ to praise God in many meaningful ways. The reality of Christ grants us freedom to enjoy all that God offers, like that sheet of animals that came down before Peter, by not limiting ourselves to tradition and custom. Freedom and the reality of Christ also helps us in great mercy to realize that while everything is permissible, not everything is beneficial for the common good, enabling us to make untraditional choices, to stand in great compassion with those who have special needs. So according to this message from God in Colossians, let us live maturely and fully in the freedom of the reality of Christ. Amen.